Reed Perkins is the Democrat running for Senate District 1. This is the very northwestern part of the state. He's our Democrat of the day. He's kind enough to join us today to talk about his campaign. Reed, thank you very much. I appreciate the time on a very busy news day. Absolutely. Uh, it's good to be with you. Hello, and from a uh, beautiful day in East Grand Forks. <laughs> a beautiful day. I have. Uh, I used to work in Bemidji. I've been through your. Uh, been through that area numerous times. It's. Uh, it's. It, it's. It is truly. There is. It's a great part of the state because it's. It's. It is kind of. You get out of those forests. You get over towards the the river there, uh, up in the northwest. It, I mean, it is. It's. It's different. That's one of the things I love about Minnesota is it's underrated in the fact that there's a lot of different areas which have their own unique character, uh, whether that's Grand Marais, Pipestone, Rochester, and uh, in the very northwestern part of the state. They're all – I've got uh, friends that live up in that area. It's It's got a real interesting culture and a unique style. It does. It does. It does. And and the that this, this stretch of Minnesota that's between – the Red River and Lake of the Woods. There's there's so much up here that's that's unique and gorgeous, uh, I, and I'm I'm thrilled to to be running to represent it. Let's first of all find out a little bit about yourself. Who exactly is Reed Perkins? Sure. So um, I was born and raised in Minnesota, just south of the Twin Cities, in the kind of Apple Valley, Farmington area. Um, went uh, got a, went to Wisconsin, got a degree in biology, uh, moved in with my now wife, uh, and she was at the University of Iowa, got an Air Force scholarship, and I said, great, I'll follow you. And so she is still active duty military. Uh, we first went to Dover. I continued my schooling, got a degree in teaching. We then moved down to Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, I worked in and around on base uh, with a lot of homeschool students. Uh, we had our first child. We now have two gorgeous daughters. Um, moved up with them at the end of our time in Biloxi, we got the option. They said, hey, we've got two bases you could move to next. And they said, all right, what's the first one? And they said, Panhandle of Oklahoma. And we said, okay, what's the second one? And they said, Grand Forks. And they said, wait, like bordering Minnesota, making it so that the grandparents wouldn't have to get on a flight to see their grandkids and that we could be back in the state that both my wife and I miss and love? And they're like, yeah, that's the one. And we said, awesome. So my <laughs> wife is at Grand Forks now. Uh, uh, we live here across the border in East Grand Forks. Uh, Like I said, two daughters, love them both to death. Uh, And getting back here then, my thought was, all right, I'm back in the state that I love. What can I do that both thanks the state for everything that it gave me in preparing me to go off and and see the rest of the country, Uh, but that also then matches some of what my wife is doing, that goal to give back and to serve um, and looked around, I've always had kind of an eye for current events. My parents raised me with an idea that you should always be connected, and that was part of, resp- of being a responsible citizen. So state legislature was the next best uh, option to look at. So threw my hat in the ring. Uh, the first day after the 2018 midterms, I emailed around um, because nobody wants to talk about 2020 until 2018 is done. <laughs> exactly. I was so- going with that. <laughs> Yeah, so e- emailed around, got great responses from the local Democrats in the area, um, and pretty much been in some variety of campaign mode off and on since then. Um, we were thrilled that that year and a half of work landed us the DFL endorsement. Um, you know, now now nobody's really certain what campaigning is going to look like moving forward, but uh, we're we're doing our best we can to still make certain we connect with voters and we talk to people about what their needs are. We had a virtual town hall two weeks ago that was very well attended. We've been at two of the farmers market openings up here in our corner of the state, um, and we're just kind of taking each news day as we can in terms of figuring out what we can do to make certain we're out talking to people. Uh, thank you to your wife for her service. We, uh, as a veteran myself of the U.S. Army, I, I do appreciate that. I, I do like how sometimes, just not all the time, sometimes <laughs> the military does it right, and they say, you know, they've they've been with us for a while. We, we've sent them around. Let's send them someplace close to home. I'm glad they got you close to home. That's that really is great. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it meant a lot to us. Well, it, of course, you know, exactly. I mean, it's just be able to to do that military service and still be close to home. That's that's a great deal. So thank you to her. Uh, you know, it, it's let's talk about the issues that are facing uh, the Minnesota first Senate district up there. You know, mm-hmm. no one 
I, I, mean, I think we all understand that the, the issues that are facing us in, in, in each individual district are very different. And once again, you are in a district where the, the, for most of the people in the metro area, the, the issues that you're facing are very different and probably unrecognizable to the most of the, dist- the issues that, that affect most of the metro core. So let's talk about some of the issues that you want to address head on in, in the Senate District 1. Sure. So we, we've got kind of three issues that we've been talking about as the primary planks of our platform. And, and two of the three, I actually think the people in the metro would recognize. Uh, I mean, the first two things that we talk about everywhere we stop are health care. Uh, you know, rural health care obviously looks a little different in the way we need to approach it, but that is lacking up here. Um, the, some of these counties, you're driving an hour, hour and a half to get to the nearest hospital. So what can we do to make certain that things like telemedicine are available or going back to models of door-to-door medicine? We've seen some successful implementation in areas, but just making certain we attract doctors, nurses, and healthcare staff up to the area is a problem in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Um, Issue number two, again, something that I think is going to ring true for anybody who's a parent child care oh yeah uh, M- marshall county so just north of thief river falls uh had a this was a couple months ago and it had a uh, town hall specifically on the issue of child care because in marshall county minnesota right now the child care wait lists have gotten so long that you effectively need to put your child on a wait list before they are conceived in order for you to get a spot Um, And that's not realistic. That's not realistic for anybody to be able to work on that sort of timetable. Uh, And so when when we look around the district, one of the problems that that me and my campaign have identified is we're losing population up here. Uh, The town of Middle River up in Rosso County had a higher population in 1920 than it does right now. And so when we look at how do we attract families to the district, how do we make certain that people can choose to live up in the northwest corner of the state? And we want to make certain that being able to choose to start a family up here is your choice and that there aren't those roadblocks in the way of lack of access to affordable child care. You know, um, and again, I think that's going to that's going to ring true to people, to any parent who's fighting this child care crisis right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but certainly we're we're feeling some of that pinch a little more so Uh in 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 some of the counties up here and then the third one and and yeah this is going to break from from some of the urban centers a little bit but our our farmers are hurting uh you know we've got ag in our district we're more uh we're more row crops than we are uh grazing animals and when you look at the price of soy the price of soy is half what it was eight years ago the price of doing business not is not half of what it was eight years ago. No. Uh, and we can point to a number of causes for that. Uh, uh, look, President Trump's trade war is obviously a big factor in hurting that. But that's, that is a newer issue. But when we look at things like um, monopolization of either the farmland or the commodity, uh, when all of the land is bought up by just a couple big companies, that kills our family farmers. Mm-hmm. And when our family farmers get hurt, the backbone of our small towns is enormously hurt. So when we look at policies that make certain we're not we're, that, that we're giving our farmers a fair chance, that too often right now the way the system is set up, that a farmer can work hard, a farmer can put in every bit of willpower and effort they possibly can, they can make the right decisions, and they can even get the weather that they need, which we haven't been getting the last couple of years, but they can even get that. And still, the economic systems do not help our small farmers, and we need to make certain that they start doing that. Reed Perkins joining us, Senate District 1. I, I, you know, I, one of the things you mentioned there, and I, I, we're not gonna, I don't want to necessarily touch on this because I do want to get back to the farming issue, because you had said about getting families up there. That was something we saw a lot in 2018 when we were doing Democrat of the Day and the amount of people who would sit there and say, you know, hey, I'm running because we moved out here. We got out of the metro area. We moved away from Sioux Falls or Minneapolis or Des Moines. We came on here. We love it and we want to encourage it. I would say broadband is another big thing that we need to get out in those areas. But you you get that and you make that, you know, there's really a a great quality of lifestyle that can be achieved out there. And I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. But I want to get back to the farming because you bring up a 
fantastic point that people just do not want to talk about, which is being exposed by this whole COVID-19 in the meat processing plants. We have a we have a we have a, a an agricultural system that we don't want to. For some reason, we we've fallen in love with the idea of the the, the guy with the pitchfork and he's got his coveralls and he's sitting in front of the farm. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, these are as much of corporations as anything on Wall Street. And these businesses yep. and the way that they're run. It, it, it basically, you, you, you limit the ability of a farmer to be able to sell their product. You force farmers to have to grow crops, which they might not grow. And you talk about margins. When your margins are twenty four twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 a year, you don't have the wiggle room to basically take no. major losses. And, and I think that that is one of the things we don't talk nearly enough about is the fact that the re one of the reasons why agriculture is suffering, not only in Minnesota, but nationwide, is that this corporatization of the agricultural yep. industry. And, and, and I will tell you that it does not matter if I talk to a Democrat or a Republican or an independent. The second I say the words market consolidation, every single person up here knows how big of a threat that is to the continued, like you said, that image of the, the guy with the pitchfork. We don't want to lose that. And unfortunately, that is the way it's going. Uh, when you look at, you know, the, some of the ag bailout money and how much of that yeah. went to multinational corporations that don't even have headquarters in the United States, much less Minnesota. And we need to make certain that, that, that if we're putting in money to support our farmers, which we need to do, that it's actually going to our farmers. Yeah. And, and, and you, that, that's, that's a huge thing that's been missing. I always just I get so annoyed by these people. That you know, I'll I'll read a story on Brownfield or something like that, uh, where you'll you'll talk about the ag issues. And my I, I I'm a big fan of ag broadcasting and ag the ag issues. I've worked in rural America quite a few times. But one of the things that always blows my mind is the amount of time you'll get this executive who basically does a play it. They they, they dress up. They 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 fake mm -hmm. being a farmer. They'll get out of there and they'll throw on some a flannel shirt and a pair of jeans and and make it look like they're working the farm every day. And the reality is is that the the people that are working in the farm are working harder than they ever have and getting less in return because that yeah. person is running it like a corporation and they get yep. they get they get they get blocked out of co-ops they get blocked out of markets and you get and once again i think one of the great tragedies and i know you said you're more crops up there but as opposed to grazing animals but when you look at these animal processing plants and they they're basically just euthanizing all their animals it's the part of the problem there is that if you're if you're that you know, micro niched within your ag sector that you can't shift things around. That's a big problem, not only for the farmer, but for our food system as a whole. And I think that that's one of yep. the things that we're really realizing is we might have made some big mistakes allowing this to get to to where the point where it's at right now. Yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely right. That when when you when we we see it with the meat processing plants, but we can certainly point to it in other areas. When you put all of your eggs in one basket and then that system fails, well, now you found out that that was the link in too many chains, and now you're seeing failures across the board. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I want to point out, you know, you're, you're, do, you're highlighting a lot of important points um, with, with how the farmers are getting blocked out of being able to sell their crops or uh, the, the, the costume play that, that other ag business owners will do. And I want to say one of the things that we've highlighted in our campaign uh, are fair repair laws and the idea that, that farmers will buy a tractor and aren't allowed to fix their tractor, that all of, the, all of the abilities to repair it are all proprietary. And so you have to, if your tractor breaks down, you've got to pay to get it towed to a factory dealership that will then charge what they want because there is no competition on that. And then they will tow it back, and your tractor's gone for that whole length of time. And what we're pushing for is for, uh, to, to give a, an, an example that, that everybody understands, it's the same way with a cell phone. If your cell phone breaks and you have to bring it to your one provider, you know, you're locked into that provider. Yeah. Um, same, same problem. And so we're pushing for those fair repair laws that p have people treat tractors the same way they treat repairing a car. Um, and that, which also then helps the local job market because then that welder and that auto mechanic who's in town, who you, you know, your family's been bringing the tractors to that same mom and pop shop for decades, now can continue to give them business instead of having somebody tow the tractor halfway across the state to another factory. Yeah. So there's, there's 
the the number of angles of attack that our family farmers have to go through right now, uh, you know, it's it's no wonder that farm bankruptcies are higher than they've been in so long. Uh, the, the line that I hear constantly up here is that this is the fifth year of a three year downturn, yeah. and and man, a lot of people up here aren't aren't certain where the light at the end of the tunnel is right now. I know a lot of people that remember the 1980s and remember that whole consolidation. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot of people say it's the same thing right now. So I definitely, yep. uh, I wish we had more time. I, unfortunately, uh, the fair repair laws, dear Lord, now that's on my radar. I am going to follow up and do some, you know, do some more shows on this uh, about that because that, that sounds crazy. But I, for the, I do want to send people to help out Reed. Uh, we need read in St. Paul. We need him representing Senate District 1. And as he sort of said, you know, the the way we volunteer is going to be different. We we you know, probably not going to be nearly as in person as it is, which is good. If you are in the metro area, help your local democrat by all means, but make a donation to help out Reed Perkins. Also, get on that volunteer list because you might be able to help out and volunteer even from your own home. So they'll figure this out. In the age of coronavirus, we'll figure this out. But Reed, yep, if people yep. if people want to donate and volunteer, help out your campaign, what's the website? The website is Perkins4MN and then the number one dot com. Right. And and yeah, exactly what you said. We're going to need phone bankers. We're going to need people to donate. And, and I, I want to emphasize to everybody, because, man, the number of Democrats who I talk to who think that this is just a red corner of the state, Senate District 1 was represented by a Democrat from the 1980s until before he retired in 2016. This has only been a red district for one election cycle. And we can make certain that it is only one election cycle. But I I want everybody to know that there are Democratic voters up here. There are a lot of independent voters up here. This is not the deep red area that so often it gets painted as. Those dollars will be so important to flipping the Senate. So please, Perkins4MN and the number one dot com. You can find us on Facebook at the same name, Perkins for MN1. We're very active there. So thank you very much for having me on today. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to shine a light on some of these ag issues and especially fair repair. Reed Perkins, Senate District 1. I'll spotlight this. We'll link to everything a little bit later on. Reed, all my best. And we'll touch base with you before too long, okay?